quick rundown of how we approach multi-user eye tracking. Uh, for vision scientists, it's, they're usually more concerned with single user applications, so we'll probably be focusing on that uh, for the majority of this presentation. Um, and then also, uh, as you'll see in the first poll, there, there's kind of a primer to the latest in, in virtual reality research that, that kind of leads into that. So I'll just uh, get started here. And for those of you who aren't familiar with, uh, with us here at WorldViz, um, we've been doing virtual reality for over 20 years. It's actually our 20th anniversary as a business this year. Uh, over that time, we've really seen the virtual reality market grow from an incredibly niche space to a, uh, you know, a, a global phenomenon in certain ways. Although, uh, you know, the types of research use cases that we focus on are still, in many cases, uh, niche interests and uh, always looking for the kind of leading edge applications uh, to push this space further. So um, here's a really quick rundown of the topics. Uh, we've already gotten the world visit introduction done. After that, we're going to go through the current VR eye tracking hardware. So um, just in case you're not familiar with this space, I'm just going to run through the kind of you know, standard VR headsets that are eye tracking equipped that people are using in labs right now. Uh, after that, I'm going to just give a really brief introduction to content creation basics. So it's going to be pretty generic about how do you approach the, the challenge, really, of creating a virtual scene uh, to run a research experiment. After that, um, I'm going to talk just super briefly about the tools Wizard and SightLab. Um, those are two tools that WorldViz produces. And uh, that's going to be what a lot of the demo is focused on, which is the way that we approach how you would uh, create a, a, an experiment with our tools. Um, so just keep that in mind, uh, that, that this isn't like a totally um, generic in, in, in the sense that we would be showing like a Unity application as well. This is really the way that we approach our, um, the, the challenge of creating virtual applications and how we do it with, with our tools. Um, but that said, there's going to be a lot of generic information, certainly up front, about, um, you know, the current uh, landscape of hardware and software uh, tools available to people. So uh, without further ado, my name is Dan. Uh, I am the head of sales for WorldViz uh, here. And uh, my colleague Sato, who is uh, off camera right now, is a is our uh, product manager for both Wizard and SiteLab. These are the the software tools that WorldViz uh, publishes for, for research applications in the virtual reality space. Um, I really just want to get a quick sense for everybody's sort of level of experience with virtual reality. So I'm launching this first poll, if you don't mind, uh, letting us know um, if you're currently using virtual reality in your research or if you're planning to, this really kind of helps us tailor this presentation. You know, how deeply do I need to <laughs> cover the sort of core basics, right? Um, you know, what is CGI, <laughs> uh, computer generated images, obviously. So um, I think we've got some great responses so far. It looks like a lot of people have responded. So I'm about to close the poll and uh, here we go. So now we can see, looks like 33% uh, of you are currently using VR in your research, which is great. And then about half of you are not currently, but planning to. And then we've got, oh, sorry, I, sh I, sh I should click share. So now you can actually see the results. So um, as you can see, uh, many of you are planning on using VR, but you're not currently. So that's perfect because this is uh, basically the webinar for you. Um, the next slide here, we're just going to dive right into uh, hardware. And uh, the way that we approach uh, hardware for eye tracking research with virtual reality, uh, right now there are mobile headsets out there. Uh, most of them do not include uh, an eye tracker inside of them. Um, I think there's there's one from Pico that might be included in an eye tracker. Uh, but in general, we use Windows-based systems, um, PC effectively. Uh, Apple has not released their uh, virtual or augmented reality headset yet, although it's been long rumored. Uh, so for now, uh, just like we always have been, we're in the Windows and PC-based ecosystem. Um, and it really is gonna give you great performance uh, when you're using a PC for virtual reality. Uh, we are typically still using PCs that are cabled to PC, to uh, still using VR headsets that are cabled to PCs. Um, there are adapters for some, uh, but generally you're gonna get the best performance when you're actually tethered to a PC 
and when you're using effectively a high-end gaming PC. So in this case, um, we would recommend some kind of NVIDIA RTX card, uh, either the 20 or the 30 series are the most recent ones, but you can go back and get even a 1060 card right now. Uh, they're really affordable. Then a decent processor, something like an i5 or i7. Um, obviously, these are just kind of minimum benchmarks, right? So you can get better than this. But uh, if you're just saying, what do I need to go out and buy a computer right now to do VR research? This is really kind of what, what your minimum specs are. Um, so once you've got your PC in hand, then you need to select a headset. So the, the systems that we are supporting right now uh, with our eye tracking software, um, and keep in mind, this isn't an exhaustive list, but it is 70, 80% of the headsets out there that are doing eye tracking. Uh, the most popular one, and also kind of the first to market is the Vive Pro I. Uh, the one that we've really been embracing recently is the HP On The Set. And then there's also a really interesting option uh, from Pupil Labs, where they actually manufacture a device where you can retrofit an existing headset. Uh, they'll send you basically uh, an eye tracking, you know, cameras that you can install into your own headset. Uh, another option is the Star VR One. It's one of these ultra wide field of view headsets. And then we also support uh, non-eye tracking headsets such as the Quest, which is the one that is really the most popular headset in the world right now uh, from Meta, uh, AKA Facebook. And uh, what's interesting is you can actually get really great data out of these headsets that don't have eye tracking just by getting the heading uh, for where a person's looking. So you can basically make some assumptions about gaze just based on uh, the heading of the user's uh, head position in, in the space. Uh, finally, you can also just use your desktop to simulate um, eye tracking environments. That's really more for people who are, are testing before you deploy or, or start running uh, trials and things like that. So uh, just a really quick rundown. Um, again, the HP Reverb G2 Omniset Edition, very much a mouthful of a title of a name for a product, but uh, we find that this has been an excellent tool. Um, it uses the Windows Mixed Reality um, and Steam VR, uh, but that's that's its kind of software side integration. Um, the resolution is definitely the highest of these sort of, uh, more common um, headsets that, that we're talking about today. Uh, it's really nice that it has this inside out tracking, which is cameras that look out towards the world and calculate the user's position based on the cameras that are actually on the headset. The Vive, in comparison, you have to actually set up these um, lighthouse base stations uh, to create your tracking area. So that's what they would call an outside in tracking system. Um, other really interesting thing about this is that it actually has built-in heart rate sensor. Uh, it has a built-in facial camera. So the idea, and, and we'll actually be giving a presentation on this later this year. Um, so look for that webinar upcoming. But the idea was that uh, they'd created an algorithm to calculate cognitive load and that this was going to be effectively an enterprise tool for, um, you know, first responder training, uh, things like that. So this is really geared in that direction and gives you a lot more data than, than just a normal VR headset would. Um, and yeah, so if you've got any questions about that, uh, I believe the MSRP right now for this system is 1249 um, Oops, what happened to my... Oh, there we go. HTC Vive Pro I. So this is the more, you know, the original prosumer uh, headset. I would say that the really nice thing about this is that it's really battle tested as in a lot of VR labs. Um, the interesting thing that is the shared commonality between HP and the HTC Vive Pro I is that uh, the eye tracking hardware is actually licensed by Toby to these manufacturers. So um, many people are familiar with Toby. Again, the resolution is not as high as the um, Omnicept, but it has been out in the world for quite a while and used in a ton of labs. And we, we integrate this system uh, all the time um, and it's super reliable. So that's, that's one of the things uh, to consider. Slightly more expensive. Um, also, you know, with supply chain issues, sometimes these things can be kind of hard to get. Uh, the last headset that I'll talk about is just the uh, Oculus Quest. Um, this is really, you know, gonna be your lowest cost system. Um, and it's cool because it actually is totally standalone. The Vive, I should say, there is, there is the ability to give it a wireless adapter. Um, and so far the, the reviews on that wireless adapter have been quite good. Uh, but this is just by nature a standalone headset, the Oculus Quest. And um, 
yeah, same deal with the with the HP. It has the cameras that look out, um, so it's completely uncabled. Uh, it's actually got a pretty pretty good t resolution, and um, yeah, they're being sold basically uh, at cost by Meta to try and get people to adopt uh, virtual reality. So it is the lowest cost by a, by a long shot, and you can get really good data out of this just based off of the user setting. So that's basically the whole rundown of of current headsets that that we work with all the time. Um, you know, if you guys have any questions, I, I didn't mention this at the top, but we do have a Q&A at the end. So please submit your questions and uh, we'll definitely get to those at the end. Uh, I'll be copying them out when Sato's giving the demo. Um, so keep your questions coming. Uh, we'd love to answer them. That was the great thing about doing it in person at VSS a couple of weeks ago was being able to in real time answer questions, but webinars are a little bit funnier. So if you have questions, please submit them. Um, and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, so now I just wanna talk really briefly about content creation. Um, some basics of content creation, including you know, the difference between 3D graphics and 360 video, uh, some really you know, good resources for creating 3D graphics uh, with you know, some software tools and at home tools as well. Uh, and then some great online resources that you might be interested in or may, might not know about right now if you're uh, going into this content creation world. Because really at the end of the day, hardware is one half of the equation. And in many ways is the easier equation to solve because you just make a decision about what system you're gonna purchase based on the available information. Uh, the harder problem to solve is how am I going to get a paradigm? Uh, how am I gonna make a virtual reality experiment and then deliver that, right? So um, oftentimes people hire companies to build things for them. Uh, but that's oftentimes very time consuming. Um, what we wanna do is just create tools that allow our end users to very quickly create their own experiments. Um, so that's kind of some tricks of the trade we'll be sharing with you right now. So the first thing to note is 3D, 3D models. So this is, I think, the, the most common conception of a virtual reality experience is when you're walking through a virtual space so something that's built out of polygons, right? Um, and, you know, you can get these from uh, students or, or artists making things out of effectively whole cloth on Blender or 3ds Max are some really common 3D modeling software tools. Uh, but now there's actually this incredible resource available called Sketchfab. So if you've never seen Sketchfab before, it actually has a layout similar to Instagram. And uh, you can just go on Sketchfab and uh, check basically the downloadable uh, checkbox uh, near the top of the screen there. And that'll bring up every model um, that you could download for free or some are, are, are for pay. They're like five to $20. Um, and you can download those models. If you download them as the GLTF model type, they'll import directly into our rendering environment without any work having to be done. So, Compared to like five or six years ago, things have gotten a lot easier on this front. And then because there's so many community generated resources now, um, there's some really great places for you to start. So you don't have to worry about the necessarily finding a, a, a talented 3D artist uh, who's familiar with Blender in the art department at your university, which is kind of the traditional approach. Um, let me go to the next thing here. So other than 3D models, the other kind of easy way to create VR, easy I say in, in quotations, um, but just because it's more straightforward, is 360 video. So um, this is an example of a 360 camera right here. This is the Insta360 Pro. So you can see it's got these like fisheye lenses. Uh, you know, depends on which one you're getting. The GoPro has two fisheye lenses. Uh, the Insta Pro I think has like five or six. And basically you plop it down and you've probably seen these on social media uh, these kind of fun videos of people, um, you know, you can create these 100% wraparound videos with these cameras. Uh, there are limitations to what you can do with that, that environment once you have it. Um, basically, it's just like any video, you're just sort of stuck with it, right? Uh, in a VR system, you're basically in a fishbowl bubble that's around your head. Uh, and, and we'll show a couple examples of this later, but um, you're basically just in a fishbowl and uh, stuck to that one location. But what's nice about that is that if you have a complex environment like a supermarket or um, you know a street scene 
where you want to take data on where people are looking in these in these spaces. Uh, modeling that and and programming that in a in a 3D graphics environment is going to be pretty time consuming um, and potentially cost prohibitive. So uh, 360 camera offers a really nice option towards effectively bringing in virtual environments. By the way, if there's some background noise, I apologize. I just moved to New York City last month. So I am uh, in a, a newly uh, louder environment. Um, so the, the last thing I wanna talk about in terms of just like content generation is uh, photogrammetry. Um, this is a new technique that uh, we leverage almost exclusively for our, our uh, more like business to business applications. And that's uh, really a, an awesome way to create 3D models out of photographs. So kind of fitting in between that world of 360 video and 3D models. Um, so there's different software tools out there for this, but you can see this is like a professional rig here on the left. And then this is like a homemade rig. The, the, the way that you do this is you basically take a picture from every angle and then feed it in. Oops, I'm oh, sorry about that. Uh, you take a picture from every angle and then you feed that into an algorithm and it will generate a, uh, a model based off of those many pictures. So the results are really excellent. Um, this is actually a, a scan that I took at VSS two weeks ago, uh, just of our booth. This is with my iPhone right here, an iPhone 12 Pro. Um, and this was about two minutes that I did to take this. So it's obviously very sloppy didn't have any cleanup, but this is just with a, I think this app costs $5. Um, so you can imagine, you know, the results if you go very diligently through and, and are, or are using these more professional tools, but it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, you can sort of see how these, all of these paths are starting to align. And finally, we're actually getting uh, easy to use tools, uh, affordable tools for creating virtual experiences very quickly now. So um, it's definitely an exciting time to be getting into this. And uh, I think the barrier to entry is far lower than it ever has been. Um, oops, let me just, I wanna get out of here. Oh, so this is uh, one more space that I wanna talk about. So this is a, my, my virtual avatar when I have my hair down is, is much longer, um, but this is a great tool called Ready Player Me. Um, so you can basically just take a selfie, uh, upload it to this free browser-based program, and it will generate a pretty, pretty good metaverse avatar for yourself. Uh, Sato and I, uh, Sato, when he gives this presentation a little bit later, you'll see we use our avatars um, when we're doing our multi-user applications. But uh, this is a really great way to just sort of generate avatars quickly that are that are pretty good. Um, there's a ton of other avatars out there, but uh, this is one one very cheap and easy way to go about it, and uh, also just kind of a fun thing to do um, if you've got a few minutes in a selfie, which I think most people do. So. Um, I'm gonna give just a really brief introduction to our, our VR software right now. Uh, the long story short on Vizard, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it is an alternative rendering engine to something like Unity or Unreal. Um, it is Python based, which is you know uh, very much geared towards our research customer base. Uh, the main advantage of Vizard is that it connects to hardware very easily. There's a lot of GUI based um, applications, interfaces that we've built into the tool to make it easy to connect to complex hardware situations, such as like a headset connected to a motion capture system connected to biofeedback. So uh, we've made all of that as streamlined as possible. And it's really just focused exclusively on virtual reality and in particular research use cases for virtual reality. So if you've got like a Python library for some kind of analysis, for you know, a ball bouncing or something like that, you can import that directly into Vizard and it will um, be able to process that in your application. So that's the really quick, just very fast um, background on Vizard. And then SiteLab is our sort of new, but it's been around for a few years, tool for uh, quickly creating a VR experiment within Vizard. So let's say you don't have any background in Python or you just want a really nice space to begin from. SiteLab is a, uh, effectively a GUI overlay that Sato is going to show you very shortly um, where you can, you know, add objects to a scene, tag which objects you want to take fixation or dwell time data on, um, and then run in the experiment where you're taking all sorts of um, information on where people are looking. Uh, then we generate the data file for you. 
Uh, there's heat maps, there's uh, gaze overlay. Um, and then there's also a really cool session replay mode where you can actually replay what a participant did in a given trial. Um, so all of that is just kind of wrapped up into a nice no coding interface, but then we also give you the entire source code. So you can just use it as a template for building your own experiment. Maybe you can just take the data collection part out and throw away everything else. But basically, it's just an open-ended toolkit um, that gives you a really nice jumping off point that, that uh, Sado and company here at World has been working on for several years. So um, excited to have Sado show you. I'm gonna hand it over to him now. And um, let me just pull that up. And again, you guys, if, if there's anything, I know this is kind of a whirlwind uh, introduction to VR. For those of you who are familiar with VR, probably a lot of information you're already familiar with. But if uh, if you're new to the world, it might be a little overwhelming. So just let me know uh, in the question section, um, and we can answer your questions here at the end. So let me hand this over to you now, Sato. I'm going to make you the presenter. There we go. Okay, awesome. so you can um, you can see my screen. Let me know if you uh, have any issues. You could hear hear me and see me just fine. Yep, we got you, Sato. Perfect. Okay, so yeah, I'm just starting, and this is actually something I got off of Sketchfab. So the setup process is basically the same, whether you're running a multi-user eye-tracking experiment or a single-user eye-tracking experiment. And so this is just that Sketchfab website that Dan was talking about. I got this downloaded this model, just came right into uh, our software here, and this is kind of the the building tool where I could set up my scene or kind of decide where someone is going to start within the scene or I could add more objects or set areas of interest or objects of interest. And so right now I could just uh, show you really quick. So if I want to first add like another object, I can just go up here to file add. And so we have also a lot of objects that are included with the, the software, but these are also just ones you could get off Sketchfab. So I could just I don't know, I could add anything here, like a crate. And now we have this object, and I could place it where I want it in the scene. If I want to move it to a different place or something. And then you can also go and change the name of, of what this object is. This just came in as crate group. And now, also, if I wanted to um, add an area of interest, then I could go and add something like this, which is just an object that I could scale so say for instance i wanted to see if somebody was looking at this uh this door more often than other areas within the the scene then i could just scale this to fit whatever part of the scene that i want to see if somebody is looking at and then i could also change the um well, Hang on a second. My webcam just took over the whole screen. I don't know why. Yeah, so I could change the visibility of of this object too, so that the participant wouldn't see it in the scene. So I'll just select the side and the top. And now also, if I wanted to change the name of what this is, I could just call this door. That is right click and go to rename. And now when I'm setting up the scene, scene also, if I wanted to uh, see where I was going to start within the scene, which direction I was going to be facing, I could just bring in like a stand-in avatar for that. So if I go over here, bring in this avatar model, now I can see when someone starts, they're just going to be facing this direction. I could move this if I wanted to or change like to a different starting point, but I'll just keep it at that. And that's basically it. I mean, if I wanted to, I could go and adjust the lighting in here or add more objects. So this is kind of what you see with a typical 3D modeling program where you get the ability to add lights and change like maybe the background environment or things like that. But I'll just keep this. And so all I need to do at this point is just save this into my environments folder. And then it'll automatically show up when I want to go and run an experiment. And like I said, this is the same setup for whether it's single user or multi-user. So first I'll just run through this in the single user. 
And so I have the um, the SiteLab script here. And now I can choose from different types of hardware. If you're using any of the um, Steam VR based like or Open VR based headsets, then you could just use the the Vive no eye tracker. Or if you're using Oculus, you could use Oculus no eye tracker. And then that'll just get head position instead of the the eye gaze point position. And so this is, for instance, yeah, if you're using like a Pimax or something like that, you would use the Vive no eye tracker. I'm gonna use the Omnicept. There's also a desktop mode if you want to just prototype with the desktop. And so I'll make sure my controllers are on. And yeah, as Dan mentioned, this is the Omnicept, which has the um, also the ability to collect heart rate and facial tracking and then the cognitive load. Oh, Steam VR has encountered a critical error. I guess I need to restart Steam VR. Okay, there we go. And yeah, so here I have the interface. I could choose um, to record a video, but there is also a session replay, which gives you the ability to replay the whole scene in an interactive way so that you could actually put on a headset and go and, and look back at where someone walked around and, and what they looked at or or on a desktop and then replay that in 3D and have all of the analytics that you could um, place on top of that replay. I could choose how many trials I want to run. If I keep that um, blank, it'll just run an infinite number of trials and save each data file separately. And then for the uh, for this threshold time, that's basically, so when you are looking around in the scene and if I've just defined something like I did that door as an area of interest or the, the crate, then if you, basically the, the midpoint between your, your pupils it's drawing an intersection line to where it intersects with that object. And if it intersects with the object for longer than this threshold, which right now is at 500 milliseconds, but you could change this, then it'll be collected and show up in, in the data file saying that you had fixated on the object and how long you were uh, looking at it for and then how many times you looked at it. And then this is where I could choose the avatar that I'm using. And so if we're, when I show the multi-user, I could show that then you could have multiple avatars and you can choose what controllers you're using. And so here is where I have whatever environments that I've saved into my resources folder will show up here. And if I click on configure, now I can choose whether I want to collect data on these various objects, or also if I wanted to grab, for instance, like if I want to grab the crate, I can check that box and now anyone in the scene will be able to grab the object as well. This would be if I just wanted to manually add an object or um, yeah, you can also do that in the code. And so now I'll just uh, press continue and then you could put in the uh, participant information. And then the ID is where that that's basically saving a data file where you have each trial saved separately, where you get the um, metrics, where you have like pupil diameter, gaze point position, the timestamp, like when you are looking at different objects and things like that. Oh, I think I actually need to restart this because Steam VR crashed. Sorry. Okay, so I'll just start this again. Oh, there we go. And so I think, oh, I selected two different controllers. So now you can see, I don't see that, that um, by default, that green point right there is the midpoint between my pupils. As a participant, I'm not seeing that. I could toggle that on or off but it's just basically a uh, look around in the room and now I can grab or interact with this object. I could move around. 
or I could look over at the, the door, the bed. And now if I um, end this trial, I could look around and see um, a 3D gaze path of where I looked in the scene. And now if I ran this, since I selected uh, to run two trials, now I could run this again, and this would be collecting a new data file. Oh, I guess that's selecting infinite trials. And so now that I have that, this is I'll show you the session replay really quick. And I'll just view this in, in desktop. As I said, I could also view this in VR if I wanted to. And so I could choose which trial I want to view. So I'll just choose trial one. And now here I could um, press spacebar and I can review this. I, like I said, I could view this in a headset or I could move around in 3D. I could pause this and look around, or I could toggle on and off any of these metrics here. So if I wanted to uh, not see timestamp, and here it's showing on the top left, this is the pupil diameter at this given time. This is the timestamp, and then it's showing that I started looking at the the crate here. Now I could keep playing this. And then I could toggle on and off like the, the gaze visualization or there's uh, fixation spheres which just grow in size depending on how long you look at something for. Or I could restart this or scrub through to different parts of it, what I was doing in that experiment. And then also with the 360 video, that's also um, pretty simple to set up. So in this resources folder, any 360 videos or images that I place in this folder will just show up that I could use to run an experiment with and show, also show that with a single user real quick and then I'll show both of these with, with the multi-users. And I'll just choose to run this on desktop right now. So I could choose based off of whatever um, videos or images I have in here. Then I can choose to record a video of this experiment or just have a session replay. And so now this is just is using a simulated eye tracker. So I could just use the mouse to look around and it's simulating as if it's, if it's an eye tracker. And now that that's saved, now I could go back and do a session replay of the 360 video. And that just follows where I was looking and I have the same um, metrics and, and the same analytics that I could see with the, the 360 video, which is like this 3D gaze path and the gaze point, things like that. And then also in the in the data folder, so this is where you get the, the raw data saved so you have um for that trial that i ran tracking data trial this is showing the timestamp and then the xyz position of the gaze point like the midpoint between your two pupils and then when i put on the headset it'll start showing the pupil diameter and then you could you could set different flags so if you wanted to also have custom flags of something that was happening in this scene then you could set that to happen as well and also I wanted to mention, so this also connects to a, a physiological um, measurement systems like Biopack. So with Biopack, there's a software that then you could put on like a heart rate sensor, skin conductance, or things like that. And then this automatically, pretty much just one line of code, this will send to Biopack and you could have the same events then synchronize with the physio data that's being saved with their software.
and then you have the um, experiment data where it's just giving you kind of a summary of when you looked at different objects over that threshold and then how long the total time so for the crate total time 7.32 seconds and the average time average view time and the number of views and then a timeline of when you looked at each object and then i have the same thing with the 360 video as well so for the 360 video you can also do um the areas of interest similar to what i added here where you can set a part of the video that you're interested in and for that i mean it, it's a little bit um more set up just that you basically have to choose where that area of interest is located and if it moves like if, if it's a moving object in the scene then that might um you'd have to have that object move but that is something that this also supports and so now i could show this in a multi-user unless there's any see if there's any questions really quick but i guess i'm not seeing the Tater, yeah. we're getting a lot of questions but I, none, none that i think are pertaining immediately to your presentation so we can answer these more generic questions towards the end but please keep the questions coming we're doing our our best to answer them as they come in too okay yeah and also um as dan was mentioning this is also completely customizable so if you wanted to go in and modify the code then you can very simply add things like um if you wanted to add proximity sensors or change things that happen within the scene then you could go in and use python to to add additional functionality as well but now I'm just going to run, I'm just going to show really quick then how this works for the multi-user. So basically with the multi-user, you have to run a server script, and then you run your client scripts. You can run one server and one client on the same machine, but you can only run, run one client per machine. And so I'll just start the server. And now you get pretty much uh, a similar kind of setup where you could choose the amount of trials you could choose to record a video and then you have your environment here and i could configure if i wanted to grab like for instance the guitars and then each client would um connect running a separate script which is the client script and this could also work across um, different networks but that would and you'd have to use something like a team viewer basically to create a vpn to appear as if you're on the same network and so that's the way that um if you're on different networks you would connect and that would be using a vpn and so now i'll just choose which client number i am going to be so right now we just have five clients available or up to five clients and you put in the the name of the computer that's running the server and then i could choose which avatar i want to be and now i'll go i actually have my laptop also set up on the same network so i'll go and start the client from that side And I guess I mean, you're not seeing the screen from my laptop, but I'm just choosing what avatar I'm using and um, making sure I'm connected to the server. So now if I, I'm just using the desktop mode again, but now you can see there's Dan's avatar and I could, uh, move out a little bit so you could see both of us here and now this is just showing a gaze gaze ray just based off of where i'm moving the mouse since this is a simulated eye tracker here and i could go and grab this uh guitar off the wall if i wanted oh, oh actually i guess i just chose that one to be grabbable and now I could go and move around on the other laptop just using the scroll mouse wheel and 
and now it's collecting the data of also like locally it's it's saving the data of where we're looking and our gaze point position and if we were wearing a headset it would save the people diameter you could also save like a shared gaze so you could adjust the threshold of um if two participants are looking in, in pretty much the same location you can adjust the diameter of that where it's saying that there's a shared um gaze at that point and then it could save how long there's a shared gaze and i can go back and and i could continue to run trials if i wanted to and now since i have i think i chose to save a video recording so yeah i can go back now and and then review Oh, well, that was just that really short one, that last trial right there. And then it works similarly with the uh, 360 videos as well. So you could run a, a multi-user with the 360 video, but then you wouldn't see each other's avatars. You would just both share looking at the same video essentially. So I could run that really quick. So I could choose whatever videos or images I have loaded in here. And then run the clients. And so for for the video, it's it's pretty quick setup if you're just wanting to drop in media and just look around and then see where the participants are looking and what they're focusing on. And as I said, you could also add areas of interest within the 360 video. And if you wanted to modify and add more things, like maybe have a, a GUI that pops up to ask someone a rating about what they're, um, I don't know, what they are looking at or what they're thinking, then you could have add that pretty easily in the code. And there's example uh, code for that, that are, that's included as well. Hey, Shado, not to jump in here, but we did get an audience question to demonstrate how to add areas of interest to a 360 video. Um, not sure if you've got something that you can show. I've got something I can show really quick, but if you've got something you could show, that'd be great. Um, yeah, if you want to show, I mean, I, I could demonstrate how it works, or if you want to show the one that you have. Yeah, I, I can show the one that I have really fast. Let me just, okay. Let me just pull up my site lab. You'll, I'll have to make myself present it really fast. Oh yeah. Um, I'll turn my camera back on, I guess. Um, here we go. So I will, oh, thanks, Sato. Yeah. So if I, I have this, um, if I just go ahead and I open up my site lab VR 360, um, it'll go ahead and run. I'll, I'll select desktop again. Um, and then what I did, uh, so this is just a picture that I had taken with my 360 camera personally when I was on the trip uh, to the Grand Canyon. So um, I'll just put my ID, the CSS, uh, submit. So this already has an area of interest applied. So you'll see it pop up um, basically when I look over here, uh, gaze fix fixation area one, fixation area two. So the way that we added these areas of interest is, uh, it's kind of funny right now, there's a little bit of a workaround for it, but what you do is you actually do the screen recording of that, like what I just did, you record your, your screen, you go back, you see exactly the moment that the ball is on, the, the little intersect ball is on the object that you wanna take data on, and then you actually go into the code and you type in the coordinate system that is produced in the text file of the data. So you, you basically, you, you'll you see in the, like, um, in the recording the exact, you know, milliseconds that the ball is on the object, object that you wanna record. You open up your text file, you scroll down, and then you set that object. So I set the position of the fixation uh, with the coordinates, and that was how I was able to get uh, that. So it's, it's a, it's it's kind of funny right now, but it definitely works, um, and it's it uh, only takes about five to ten minutes to to set it up. So yeah, that's that's it for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you want to run through anything else, Sator, or should I? Um, I mean, I could really quickly um, 
to show the the heat map also or i mean i could also show the the data file where you where you what you were talking about where you copy and paste like the coordinates yeah. of where you're looking yeah i'll send it back over to you really fast but hopefully that answered uh, the question from the audience there so let me make you the presenter again here stato there we go and i'll go back to typing questions out and we'll have the q a soon so please uh, keep the questions coming I just, yeah, I just turned off my webcam because it fills up my whole screen. Um, yeah, so what Dan was talking about, so if you are looking at a particular object and you go to that point in the video, so say 2.75 seconds, you're looking at that person, then you just put in the X, Y, Z coordinates of that area into the code, and then that's basically it, and then it works as a as a fixation, as an area of interest. And... Um, and yeah, I was also showing, so we also have the heat map. So this is just looking around, just using a desktop mode. And then you could go and adjust the intensity of the heat map. So if I um, ran this again, I could look around and actually, yeah, that's a pretty quick one, but I could run this a little bit longer. And again, this is, I'm just using the desktop mode. So if I move around in the scene and focus on different areas. Now this is just generating just based off of where, basically where my mouse was looking But yeah, I mean that's that's the basic setup. It it gets a lot more um, involved. I mean, as you go into like adding things to the code, and if you want to modify, or as I mentioned, you can also send events to to Biopack. So you can you can see there's actually a pretty good webinar in our YouTube page where um, Alex Dimoff from the company Biopack is showing this connecting to their Biopack physiological measurements. Is, um, devices and then sending events and synchronizing that way. And then, yeah, I think I went over the basics. I mean, it gets a lot more involved when you wanted to go and, and modify it, as I said, because it's built off of Vizard, so there's a lot more functionality that Vizard also adds with all of the different um, modules that Vizard has based off of like if you're adding physics or avatars or proximity sensors or wanting to add additional hardware, which also um, this can connect to any of the hardware that's supported by Vizard, which is over 150 different devices like data gloves and full body tracking systems and projection. Well, I guess you wouldn't use projection systems with the eye tracking unless, yeah. And then you have all the different headsets, like the ones that are supported that, um, all the basically PC-based headsets and then the eye tracked headsets like Vibe Pro I. And then also, yeah, I wanted to mention too, so I, I mentioned you could add custom flags, but then if you wanted to do something like a gaze-based interaction, then that's also just a few lines of code where you go in and then when someone is looking at the, um, basically when they meet that threshold, you would just, Right now, I just added, like, to send an event to Biopack, you could just add a, a line of code here to have something happen when you focus on that object. So that's for having something that um, initiates when you stop looking at something or when you start looking at something. But yeah, I guess we can start getting some questions now. I don't know if, um, yeah, feel free to ask things that maybe you still feel weren't covered enough or in more detail. and. And we'll share these slides with you. And, and also there's the full documentation online that you can look through and see how all of this stuff is created. But but basically it's pretty quick and, and easy just for setting up a scene, getting some models, and then just automatically connecting multiple participants and saving some data and then be able to, to view some analytics of, of where they were looking and things like that. 
that I could yeah definitely back I think as a pretty pretty comprehensive introduction um, obviously yeah I'll go ahead and share my screen um, I think trying to see if we got any more questions so a lot of these questions we answered in the chat already um, but uh, just to kind of run through it really quickly the oculus quest we do support um, you either have to have it cabled to the PC or it also supports the air link um, it doesn't have eye tracking, but you can get basically heading based gaze direction, uh, which can be, you know, pretty, pretty darn useful. Um, so all of that's supported by Visitors Inside Lab. Varjo we support as a headset, but we haven't integrated the eye tracking yet. Um, so that's uh, potentially on the, uh, on the development schedule for us. Um, in terms of compiling to a standalone app, you can compile your wizard code to an executable file. Uh, that's something that that has always been a feature of uh, either a wizard development or a wizard enterprise license. Um, just kind of lightning lightning round going through these. Um, if there's additional questions, please please let us know. Um, are we focusing more on VR than on uh, augmented reality? In in general, I would say yes. Uh, things like the uh, Hololens and then um, uh, the other kind of glasses looking one. I believe are all running on Android based, uh, you know, operating systems. So uh, we're really more focused on the uh, Windows space, but you can also get in um, uh, some of these newer headsets have these actually kind of awesome video see through capabilities, uh, which we are supporting. Um, so that is something in, in the augmented reality world that I think is really interesting uh, that you can use uh, in this kind of ecosystem. Um, the question about how many degrees of the visual field for VR headsets, uh, that, uh, it, it depends on every headset. So earlier the slides, uh, I think the, it was 98 degree field of view for the, for the Omnicept and like 110 field degree field, 110 degree field of view for the, uh, uh, Vive Pro I, but then the star VR. And I think there were a couple other headsets that came out over the years that were really focused on ultra wide field of view and they almost look like hammerhead sharks because they're these huge kind of screens. Um, but actually surprisingly lightweight and comfortable as far as star VR goes. But uh, that's like 210 field degree, uh, 210 degrees field of view. Um, so there are some specialty headsets that, that will give you a, a larger field of view. Um, but the standard headset, like the kind that you go down and, and get it at uh, you know Best Buy, uh, around 100 to 110 uh, degrees. Um, Seder, this is a question um, that we got from uh, some folks interested in the TeamViewer. Uh, is it just the free version of TeamViewer that we need for um, for using the multi, for doing a remote session? I, I know I had just done the, the free version. When yeah, we've you done can it use before. the free version. I mean, it, it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. it's just, um... Yeah, you just have to check check the VPN option, and then you, that's it. But yeah, you you can use the free version. I mean, I have that also on the um, documentation. So you basically just the clients each download Team Viewer, then you connect to the VPN, and then you just have to send a, a partner ID and password, basically. Yeah, I mean, you and I set it up a few weeks ago, and it was uh, surprisingly easy and and super fast too. So um, yeah, so if you want to get that set up for remote collaboration let us know we can uh, kind of guide you through those steps or send you the docs for it um, multiple users can you support and then what frame rate um, that is a good question I I, uh, I mean I don't think it's you go ahead Zito. yeah please well I mean right now we just have five set up by default but you can add more than that I'm not, I'm not sure if there really is a limitation I mean I think it just is as long as you can ping each other and you can be basically seen as if you're on the same network, whether it's with a VPN or uh, uh, if you're all connected to the same network, then we haven't really tested the limits right now. Just five seems like a, a good number to have as a default setup. And then you could just, yeah, we can, we can add more than that. And the frame rate is really just depending on your hardware because depending on what kind of video card you have and the types of models, 3D models you're using, then that's going to really be the limitation. I mean, I know that most headsets, the refresh rate is 90, I think, hertz for the Omnicept. 
And so it should stay at that frame rate unless for some reason, like I said, your hardware isn't keeping up with what you're rendering. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, we'll leave this open for a minute. Uh, let's see, anybody, any more questions from the audience here? Or, um, we will be sending out just a very short survey. Uh, we'd really love to get your feedback on the usefulness of this webinar to you. And then also we have some questions about what are the most important parameters? Because um, we definitely, you know, we, we like to take input from the community and really make sure that we are uh, building tools that suit your needs, right? So if there's something that you're looking for, for uh, we would love to hear it in the survey. Um, and yeah, any feedback's really appreciated. Uh, definitely saw some familiar names and, and faces, quote unquote virtual faces in the audience. Uh, so thanks to everybody who joined. Um, uh, anything else you'd like to add, Sato, or should we, uh, should we uh, well, let everybody to uh, enjoy the rest of their Wednesday? Oh yeah. There's also additional um, eye tracking functionality depending on the headset. So for instance, with the Vive Pro Eye and the Omnicept, we were showing, I was showing pupil diameter, I, don't know, I guess that was mm -hmm. just showing up on the, the track, the data file, but it also, you can do eye openness value and that can be per eye. And that really just depends on the, the API of, of the headset itself. So like pupil labs, for instance, allows you to save like a video recording of the pupils themselves whereas the Vibe Pro I yeah. doesn't allow that. And so that's something, I mean, you could ask us and then the additional functionality that we add with the the algorithms of SiteLab, then that's where we um, build off of that kind of functionality. But but some of that is also varies by headset. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, you know, we, we definitely from the vision science community, a lot of, uh, get a lot of great questions and, um, yeah, <laughs> the pupil labs is funny because you, you actually can take that recording of the eye and that's a question that's come up multiple times. But then pupilometry is something that's pretty uh, pretty common across all headsets as far as we, as far as I know. Um, so if, if there's a specific hardware configuration that you already have or you're thinking about getting and you wanna know how it would work with our software, uh, that's absolutely something that we can help. And if we don't know the answer, we'll figure it out. So <laughs> yeah, um, anything anything else uh, to add there, Sato? Uh, not that I could think of right now, but yeah, feel free to, to ask, I mean, email us with more questions or comments, because I'm not sure if we really get to cover yeah. everything in, in one session. And Yeah, it's definitely a lot, but uh, we don't have our, our sales at World Biz, or we usually have a final slide with uh, some contact information, but um, you can just respond to the uh, webinar invite, and we'll definitely get that. Um, and then also, yeah, please please fill out that survey. And thanks again to everybody who joined. And uh, hope to see you again at, at VSS next year, virtual VSS or physical VSS. But um, great to great to have you all. And uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. All right, gonna shut it down now. Take care, everybody. <laughs>